This episode of Around the Layout is brought to you by Weather My Trains. Hey, are you like me and the thought of doing a DIY weathering job on an expensive engine leaves you in fear? It's time to call in Rob Arsenault at Weather My Trains. Do what thousands of satisfied customers have done and let Rob help you notch up the realism on your layout with beautifully detailed weathering on your locomotives and rolling stock. To see what Rob can do for you, check out his website at weathermytrains.com. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Around the Layout, where model railroaders come to tell their story. My name is Ray Arnott. So glad you could join us on this episode. We're talking to Joe Bohannon. Joe, welcome to the show. Hey, Ray. Pleasure to be here. Glad to have you here. Another Texas connection we're uh, we're making tonight. You are recommended by well, a whole strew of those Texans between Greg McComas and Chris Palmieri, Chris Atkins, Dean Ferris. Who am I leaving out? Oh, there's too many to list. You know, I was thinking we may have to rename your uh, tri-state group to the quad straight group. Yeah, well, we may just have to throw Texas, although Texas would just <laughs> go right over the top of all our three little states up here. But uh, glad to have you on the show. Um, looking forward to talking to you. Uh, you got a lot of really cool stuff going on with your layout and uh, the freelance railroad that you're you're creating. So looking forward to getting to that. But before we get there, let's start in the beginning. Tell me, what started your journey in the model railroading hobby? Oh, probably lifelike trains for me. Uh, I'm a product from the 80s myself, but I have memories from when I was a child having a uh, Conrail Blue F7 with can opener logo, you know, that iconic traditional train set. And uh, my parents splurged and they bought this foam oval you know double over thing that came from lifelike for a couple of years and that was just a blast you know and and i think that's what cemented it for me but uh you know i was told even when i was like four years old riding the durango and silverton and uh, doing some other things i think it had always just been a part of my background and it still is today we're talking about that on a on a previous show you mentioned lifelike and <laughs> you know the progression of the, you know what era you grew up in and what beginner railroad you had it, it seems like i think life likes that's the first one but it fits in it was either lionel tyco and now life like i think that like kind of defines your era doesn't it it's like maybe late 70s is tyco and maybe maybe even that early 70s and then prior to it it's lionel and for you it was life like that brought you in uh was was it just a random gift or you 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 mentioned uh some some uh prototype trains that you saw as a kid what, what, did that come before the model railroading oh i'd always been a model railroader i i think it was one of those things that was subliminal just having been around trains uh you know before i can really consciously remember but um as for the model trains uh that's that's what drove me um those horn hook couplers and you know traction tires and all that but uh um, I'm glad I discovered Athern at some point, though. I don't know that I could have continued modeling with with uh, with what life like uh, was back then. I don't want to speak negatively of them because that was the introdu you know introduction. Um, it definitely has its place, but um, yeah, it definitely grew beyond that pretty quickly. I, th I think it's just modest beginnings that give us appreciation for for a little bit nicer stuff. How did that progress? Did you, you said you started to find Athern and, and uh, the such, what did you have for a setup? Did you have it, uh, your track set up anywhere in your, in your house? <laughs> um, yeah, always in the way. Um, <laughs> I remember my dad always getting upset with it being around. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm going to progress a little bit more towards my teenage years. I would, uh, I would actually save up my lunch money and uh you know got a driver's license can go do things and i i discovered a friend of mine that liked trains uh in high school and we would go after school and we'd go spend you know a little bit here and there and buy things and and fortunately the blue box era was a lot more friendly with cost too that we could get away with spending lunch money and um we had a couple of really good hobby shops in town um we had one uh 
that actually had a layout in there and I'd go in there and, and, you know, watch the trains run around for a little bit. And my parents knew I liked trains. So, you know, birthday gifts or whatever, would be a trip to the hobby store or whatever. And, and it was definitely very supportive. Uh, but I, I still have quite a few of those trains actually today uh, as a result of that collecting back then. But as for a layout, nothing as a kid, uh, you know, just floor top stuff. Um, I think my high school years, I, I, try to take some two by four studs and make myself a little thing and discovered how heavy it is to build bench work out of studs. Um, <laughs> yep. that, that didn't work out too well, but it was something I could play with a little bit here. And, and there's actually some photos floating around to this day of, of, of wow, a long time ago now, I don't want to date myself now, but a long time ago now, but, uh, yeah. And then, uh, I'm going to jump ahead. I, I kind of, you know, feel like, uh, Moving into my young adult years, I did develop a layout um, called the San Pedro Eastern. Um, okay. It was a switching layout. Um, let me back up for a second. So I did attend an NMRA regional meet while I was in high school, and they had an NMRA time saver there. And uh, I played with that quite a while. I enjoyed the challenge of it. Uh, trying to get your your time down and 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 doing things and um, as a kid, I mean, it, it's a, a switching puzzle was just entertaining and it was eye opening in some ways because you know you look through the magazines and you look at your inspiration and you want these really big things and and I'm still there. I really want big things, but when you're there and and you're doing these switching puzzles and you get them done and then you look at the clock and you're like, wow, I didn't realize, you know, 30 minutes went by or an hour went by or whatever it was. Um, there's definitely room for that. Um, I wish that there was more emphasis on that to some degree. So I took the actual mm -hmm. time saver and I took it on Atlas's, you know, railroad layout developing software and I, I expanded it a little bit, grew the sightings out a little bit, added more carload count. And um, where I was living at the time was a studio apartment that had a bookcase right in the middle between my living room and my, my bed area. And it was probably only about 18 inches long. And uh, I don't know, maybe 10 feet long. And I looked at that and I said, you know, I, I can put a time saver there. And I did. I, I, I bought me some two inch styrofoam and I actually printed all of that track work out in, in real scale or HO scale, you know, and I literally had the track right on top of those drawings. And uh, that, that became the San Pedro Eastern. And believe it or not, that layout still exists. It, uh, it belongs to a friend of mine out in California still. Um, oh, wow. And it, it, it was a lot of fun, but yeah. It also helped me discover some of my wants and druthers. Everybody talks about that. And um, I knew yeah. that a pure switching layout would not fully satisfy me. Um, I had a quite a bit, have quite a bit of a passenger collection. And uh, no matter how unrealistic it was, you know, certain cars kept migrating themselves on that layout, which it was never intended for. And I kind of, you know, discovered, hey, you do need to build what you are drawn to. And if it's going to be bigger things, then you need to go ahead and, and, and not completely dismiss that. Um, and, and the San Pedro right. Eastern had its place and I, I definitely value what it was. It was a lot of fun. Let's rewind a little bit and go back to that, yeah. that uh, regional convention. Yes, was that time saver the first um, introduction to you for operations? Was that the first time that switching these the, a model railroad entered your mind, or did you have earlier exposure to that? Never thought of that question, to be honest. I think I had a vague awareness. I mean, for me, model railroading is based on real railroading, so I think I always knew it was there. Uh, and I think okay. that the magazine showcased it to some degree, but not really to detail. So I had been vaguely aware of it. Um, I did have a small interim with a local uh, model railroad club down there where I grew up, but there it was definitely just running trains. It wasn't, uh, uh, you know, operations sake. So uh, your question is interesting. I, I would say that might very well be the first time, you know, being thrown into it, so to speak. And, you know, my decisions were my decisions. And, um, 
yeah, this is how the big railroads do it in some ways. It is a matter of trying to limit your moves and things like that. But I also, I also remember some of those switching puzzles in the back pages of like MR. You know, they would have a drawing, you know, a sequence of three or four drawings, and it'd be like, okay, you're the engineer. How would you make these moves? You know, and then you flip. You know, it seems like they always gave you the answer later, like a month later, or whatever. It tell you, oh, you could do that in five moves. Here's how you would do it, or whatever. Those were fun to look at. You know. Yeah, because what I find, you know, as we're talking to to folks about their journey, and it seems like when they see operations for the first time, it just becomes this pivot point in their model railroading trajectory where it just starts to really take off. And not to say that you can, you know, not stay within a continuous running, but it's just amazing that exposure to 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 switching just kind of kicks somebody off. And when you saw this time saver, it seemed like it really boosted you. It did. Absolutely. I think it will always be a part of me as a result. Um, and I definitely encourage other people who are looking for a switching layout concept. Take a look at it. There's a reason why it's a challenge. So tell us about this. Uh, what was it? San Pedro Eastern. Am I getting that right? The name of the railroad you had on your time saver? You are. Yes. Uh huh. Um, San right. Pedro Eastern. Uh, you know, I, I've always dabbled with freelance concepts. Even back in high school, I had my own freelance called the Thunder Ridge Railroad. Okay. And back then, uh, it was more or less the cart before the horse, so to speak. I came up with a paint scheme, came up with locomotives I wanted. I want this, I want that. And then I discovered that, okay, how do I make this plausible? How do I make this so that it fits? And that bothered me, I guess, in many ways. Um, yeah. I, I kind of came up with a conclusion that, oh, it must be based in Arizona. It may be based on you know, this or that. Um, but being that I was dabbling with the Thunder Ridge Railroad, um, I didn't feel like this time saver fit with what I had figured out for the Thunder Ridge. So I said, okay, well, the Thunder Ridge Railroad owns this uh, little short line that's in California around Long Beach so that they can get intermodal, you know, or whatever it was. I'm like, okay, well, this is going to be based in LA, around kind of an LAJ feel, I guess, in some ways. Um, and it was kind of fun to now have the relationship right. You got the place fixed and figured out, and now you figured out the railroad that's going to be there, and now you can kind of make them commingle and work. And it felt better doing it, in my opinion, the right or you know the right order. What introduced you to the idea of freelance railroading? Do you do you recall what uh, what sparked that idea off? Oh, Utah Belt, Eric Bruman's Railroad, Virginia and Ohio. Um, you know, I, I know periodic press isn't so prevalent today, but back when I was growing up, that was Christmas every month, being able to open up those pages, being able to see what other people were doing and, and, and getting guidance and, you know, just seeing those layouts, but no doubt, uh, for me, it would probably be Utah belt. Uh, it, it definitely, uh, was the catalyst I needed for for developing something like that, and it it just fit. Um, you get to do a lot of what you want to do, and you get to create your own rules for it, so to speak. But it doesn't have to be completely whimsical, and right. that's probably one of the biggest differences with it. Is um, freelance is based in reality. It's right. just we do it like we're our own bosses in a way, and I think everybody. A lot of people like to be their own bosses. It's it's the same way with the with the with the trains. Yeah, I I know um, I've learned a lot about freelance over the last year. Uh, a friend of yours, the guy we mentioned earlier in the show, Chris Paul Mary, when he was talking about it, and I went into that interview thinking, "Well, freelance must be pretty easy because you can just make it up." But then I learned as I was talking to Chris, and if you want to talk about freelance, there's one guy the you know just uh, enjoyable uh, imagination that he has. But you got to make it plausible, you know, for yourself. And when you start to talk about your railroad, you know, it's it it may be freelance, but there's a lot of reality that has to go into your story. Absolutely, yeah. Um, and I think that was the catalyst between a Thunder Ridge. Really, wasn't a failure outright, but it wasn't something that I was fully getting everything I wanted out of it. So I'm going to jump through into Chinook lines. Um, Chinook lines is a product of those 
losses, I guess, uh, of not having fully what I want out of it and getting an opportunity to kind of restart. That was a product of me moving up to Washington State, um, knowing I wanted to freelance, knowing that I needed to develop a story first. And and forgive me, I I realize now I didn't really answer your question if you... (laughs) That's all right. No, but this is good because we, we want to roll this into Chinook lines because that's the railroad you're doing now. And I'm sure that there was a lot of great takeaways from those first two, the Thunder Ridge and the San Pedro Eastern that, that helped you develop the Chinook lines. But before you get there, I want to, I want to ask you about Washington state. Cause you mentioned you're up there. What kind of uh, prototype railroading up there? It must've been some good influence because there's a lot up in that area. Uh, yeah, absolutely. There's a lot of uh, great influence. Um, I loved it because I, I tend to like passenger stuff, so I got to see a lot of the different Amtrak operations. But you also had your mix of your BNSF, you had UP, but you also sure. had your your uh, regional or short line railroads like Tacoma, uh, Tacoma Rail, and whatnot. So, um, a lot of interesting things. But I will tell you that we have missed a lot of the interesting railroads in Washington State, unfortunately. Um, through mergers and time and and whatnot um there's a lot more that was there from before and um that's that's what chinook plays off of is uh the milwaukee railroad existed in washington state and um when i was growing up i grew up in california so i i wasn't aware of that i remember seeing photos of of the electrics and i always knew milwaukee had electrics but I didn't know where they ran. I didn't know about Lines West. I didn't know about any of that really. And uh, I'd probably been in Washington State for a couple of years. And um, I remember going from the western side of the state to the eastern side of the state. And I see a sign on the freeway that said uh, River Depot, uh, you know, some type of historic site. And I'm like, you know what? I've got a few minutes. Let's let's go look at it. You know what? Why not? So I got off that road and and actually this is a pretty uh, memorable day. So I got off the freeway. I I followed the little signs and I ended up at this depot and there's no tracks around. I'm like, okay, well this, this is weird. Why do you have a depot? No tracks It's painted orange and maroon. I'm like, it's really gaudy. That's kind of, kind of weird. You know, what's going on with this? And then, and this is in a, in a wooden clapboard fashion. I'm like, okay, well that's, that's interesting. And so uh, they were open and I walked in and I met a couple of people who there with the Cascade Rail Foundation and they showed me what they had about it. And I, I realized that, okay, this, this belonged to the Milwaukee Railroad. And I got to talking to some of my other friends and they grew up out there like, oh yeah, I remember those orange and black locomotives and this and that. And then it really kind of forced me to dig down. I'm like, I, I know a lot about certain railroads and, you know, growing up in California, I knew about the Santa Fe, I knew about the SP or whatnot, but now I'm being challenged with the railroad that I should know about. Mm -hmm. And I was almost embarrassed that I don't know this story. And so, yeah, I got home and I started doing more research and, um, it was actually so pivotal to the point that I actually joined the Cascade Rail Foundation. I was on their board of directors for a little while. Um, and the kind of the discovery of the Milwaukee Railroad and the story that it existed there. And it was almost a lost story in many ways uh, was also the keystone that I needed for my freelance. It was like, okay, well, could this route have been viable after the demise of the Milwaukee and lines West? And uh, uh, I'm going to take a moment here because I realized that um, I've become somewhat more, uh, researched on the matter. Other, other listeners might not be, but, um, the Milwaukee built the lines West to the West coast in the early 1900s. And, uh, they were the latest of the transcons. I mean, you had your other builders out there, Northern Pacific, you had your great Northern, you had your Santa Fe and your SP and the collaborations with UP and whatnot. Milwaukee was the last. They were the last ones to get out there. So they didn't really have all of the cream to pick from. You know, the other railroads had, you know, uh, forced the migration of towns and industries along their lines. And the other thing Milwaukee chose to do is they chose a route that was more direct and faster. But it avoided certain areas as a result. And so the the corporation always felt like it was a bad decision like they made a mistake like they shouldn't have built that railroad 
And as a result of it, um, they, uh, they, they always use it as a scapegoat. And um, I'm going to kind of jump forward here for a second, but in the, in the seventies uh, with a lot of the decline of the railroads, uh, Milwaukee's management kind of wanted to become more of a real estate agency. They, they, they ceased to want to run a railroad. They wanted to capitalize on real estate. And so what they wanted to do was they wanted to divest themselves of lines West to make them more viable for merger. Basically they can pawn off the railroad on another railroad. The, uh, ICC, uh, was still reeling from the failure of Penn central. Um, they had thought the concessions that they had gave Burlington Northern, um, was going to be enough to keep Milwaukee viable. Um, so anyways, the ICC dealing with uh, Penn Central, they just didn't want to deal with it. They're like, you know what? You can abandon it. And uh, in March of 1980, the last trains rolled out of uh, lines west, uh, everything west of uh, Deer Lodge, Montana, shut down. And uh, many years later, uh, after ICC had some times to kind of delve into it, they actually discovered that uh, Milwaukee was double entering their uh, losses on lines west and that the line was actually profitable um, and that's part of why milwaukee didn't last much longer as a smaller regional outfit was uh, they cut their own foot so to speak yeah but so reading into the history of the milwaukee um, there was actually several groups that wanted to save it um, and there was one group in, uh, named save our railroad employment our soar they actually approached the Milwaukee to buy it out as if it was an employee owned railroad um, or at least the Western parts of it that were going to get shut down. I mean, think about how many people who were employed by the railroad who, you know, like a flip of a switch, they, they no longer had a job. Um, right. So, yeah. so it was a tremendous loss uh, it, to lose this, uh, this railroad. Um, so yeah, basically Chinook is playing off of the concept that that organization of SOAR uh, was able to uh, get into operating the, the the parts of the river that were in Washington State. So uh, when Milwaukee closed, those right of ways actually reverted to the states that they were in. So in Washington State, the right of way was turned over to the Washington State Department of Transportation, and it's still owned by the Washington State um, today. It's actually under their Parks Department, but uh, all of that right of way is is owned by the state. So when Washington DOT had it, um, they turned it over for bidding for an operator because, in, in my version of history, uh, they realized the economic impact losing a railroad in the area would be. Uh, Cause right. literally they'd be, they'd be faced with having Burlington Northern. Um, you do have union Pacific there and parts of it. Um, but you know, you, you lost a major East West railroad at that point. So uh, Chinook lines is basically a growth out of that uh, employee group um, and local businesses. And um, they started operating between the Seattle Tacoma area and and Spokane. And uh, over time, uh, being focused on business, they were able to grow the railroad to the point where they merged with other short lines in the state. And uh, they actually merged with BC Hydro out of, out of British Columbia, which allows us to have access with uh, BC Rail. And we also have connections in Portland with other railroads. So I call it a super regional railroad. Um, I like a lot of the concepts of Montana Rail Link and whatnot. We just do it in Washington State instead of Montana. And um, okay. That's, that's what the Chinook is or the premise of it is anyways. Where did you develop the name? Where did that come from? Hmm. It just feels Pacific Northwestern. Um, the Chinook. Okay. So the, the, another idea is what is a Chinook? And I, I love etymology. I love kind of the origin of words. I've, I've, I tried to find that answer and I can't find just one answer what a Chinook is or Chinook is. Uh, you have Chinook salmon, which is a type of uh, salmon that, that live up there. Then you also have, uh, you know, you can go military all of a sudden and talk about Chinook helicopters, which is a product of Boeing, which is Boeing's based in 
the Pacific Northwest. But yep. a lot of what I have discovered is it goes back to a tribe of Indians called the, the Chinook tribe. And they were uh, very principal in the development of Washington state because these were the tribes that the, uh, the coastal, uh, you know, the, the, the ships would come in and they would talk to the locals, the trading and whatnot. Uh, they would actually use the Chinook language um, to communicate with other Indian tribes in the Pacific Northwest. Um, and to give you an example of how pivotal the Chinook people were, believe it or not, you know, a Chinook word, muckety-muck. Muckety muck okay. is a Chinook word. It means someone of high power. So oh, that gives you an idea of how principal that they were in the economies of the area at the time. And it just felt like if you were going to build a story of where something's based and you wanted to make it the Pacific Northwest, I felt like everything kept pointing back to it. And it just, it was a neat name to me. You know, I don't think it's a name that would fit for another area of the, of the country. And so it, it helps build that story. And a lot of the decisions that I've made are made to, to, to sell the story. They're to give you something to talk about, to make you ask a question. Um, and I felt like the name helps that. And, and you're the first one to ask me that, but I had thought about it. <laughs> Well, that's good. I mean, it's important to you know understand. The, the, again, the freelance uh, concept really uh, fascinates me because I, I think I, if I would have probably thought outside the box, I think a freelance may have fit kind of the things that I enjoy: uh, graphic design, coming up with logos, coming up with schemes, and those kinds of things. I, I think that would have been a lot of fun, um, and, and it's it's always neat to hear how somebody had done it themselves and, you know, what, what drove them to go for a name or even a logo like yours. Let's talk about that because I know you're custom painting your locomotives, obviously for your freelance railroad, where'd the logo come from? Um, Facebook, ironically. Uh, so I, I adopted Facebook pretty early, I guess I, I had come from MySpace and, uh, discovered Facebook and, um, Somewhere along the way, there were these Facebook group, groups, you know, and I remember Yahoo mm -hmm. groups from before, but there was these new <laughs> Facebook groups. And I was like, you know, that's really cool. And, and I'd already belonged to a couple other groups that uh, fellow freelance modelers had had. And one of the things that they had done is they created little icons to help you find your groups. And I'm looking through these icon lists, you know, they're, they're, they're generic, they're stock. And I'm like, okay, well, I need something that says Chinook. I need something that says Pacific Northwest or whatever it was. And I, I went through it and I discovered a paw print, a bear paw. And I was like, okay, well, that fits. That makes sense. I could do that. And so I adopted a little paw print for my Chinook or for my for my group on Facebook. And uh, it'd probably been a little time after that. I started looking at my decals and and where I was going with that on my on my my models um, up to that point I had done my lettering letter by letter and I hated that. I, I don't like that. Um, getting things right. straight, getting them spaced out. Right. I'm like, okay. Uh, I had actually met a, a, another freelance modeler by the name of Hank Stevens and he'd done a lot of graphic work and uh, he helped me realize that custom decals were very doable. You know, up to that point, I was always trying to be creative, coming up with things that had been done by Microscale or or whatever. And uh, mm -hmm. you know, I kind of gave him some of my ideas, and he said, "Yeah, we can do these things." And I'm like, "Okay, well, I drew up the paw print. I wanted it to look like the shape of a C. I wanted to kind of flow into that, and I wanted to have the lines inset inside the word Chinook." And I showed this to them. He goes, "Oh, this is really cool." Yeah, I was like, "Okay, well, you know, I wonder if I can ever make these done. You know, do these up and." He actually is friends with Jim Abbott with Highball Graphics, and he goes, "Yeah, we can do these." And he got me in touch with Jim, and um, you know, we started doing some of the the custom production. Um, and uh, it's been a fun process, yeah. Uh, but that 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 paw print C was a happy accident. I'm glad it it happened, um, but it 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 definitely 
it was from that little that little icon logo and I, who who would have thought i don't know i i couldn't have planned it any differently right now now you mentioned you know that your railroad was heavily influenced by being up in washington state did you start the chinook lines in washington state or did that develop later uh, it, it was a product of washington state um when I moved, uh, I didn't have a freelance. I knew I wanted to freelance. Um, probably, you know, I, I, I picked an apartment that had a second bedroom for a reason. I know I wanted to play with this or that or try to get a little layout going. And yep. um, when I did the San Pedro Eastern, I took the um, SPSF decals and I kind of reorganized them. And so... Um, probably my first attempt when I was in Washington was to play off those same letter blocks. I just kind of felt like it was bold and not readily mm -hmm. used. You put them on a different color. It makes them harder to figure out where they came from. Um, but I played with that for a little bit and couldn't really come up with anything I really liked. Um, but it, it was, um, it was the, 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 the connection with the Cascade Rail Foundation and discovering what Milwaukee was and what we lost. Um, that allowed that progress and that growth, but it, it definitely came from being a Washington. So how do we get from Washington state uh, to where you are in Texas? Uh, when, when did that move? Occur? Uh, oh, 2012 or so, 2011, 12, somewhere in there. Um, okay. I guess I'll, yeah, real quick. My wife's from the Philippines and she moved here and she asked me, is it cold in Washington? And I said, yes, it's cold in Washington. She goes, well, can we live somewhere warmer? I said, yes, we can live somewhere warmer. And so we did. Um, she, she migrated or immigrated and, and um, I think we were only up there for a couple of months and we loaded up in a truck and we moved to wash or moved to Texas and have been here ever since. Were you able to do it before it got cold? Oh yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. She got good, to see good. snow, though. We we went over 70 in okay. the middle, you know. Uh, actually, no, yeah, we moved around Christmas, but we went over 70 during a snowstorm. And she's like, oh, this is snow. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, this is snow. <laughs> well, the way the weather's been lately, uh, you down in Texas, you can you see the snow, too. I mean, uh, it's been kind of crazy. I, my, my grandparents live in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, and uh, I, I jokingly called my grandmother this winter, and I said, hey, it's New England calling. Have you seen our winter? Because it was snowing uh, out out that way, and, and and it hadn't up here, so it's kind of funny it chasing the oh, yeah. weather. Uh, but uh, so you get to Texas, and and I'm kind of, I'm really curious how soon it takes before you start meeting these uh, these Texans that we mentioned earlier in the show. When do you start connecting with them? I think it took a little while. Um, so I know that I went to the Great American Train Show the first year I was here. And I knew that there was a model railroad presence here, um, but never really connected with anybody. Um, I think the connections probably happened more in the last five or six years. Um, I can't remember exactly if it was Chris or Greg I met first. Uh, you meet one, you tend to meet the other one. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, somewhere along the way I met, Oh, I know what it was. Forgive me. Um, I, I, I rely heavily on Facebook and, um, I knew that I wanted to get connected with people who do operations. And, and I finally happened upon a kind of an op -sig operations, uh, special interest group, um, weekend. Um, and, uh, it very well may have been Chris that was planning it or organizing it. I'm not really sure, but, but one of these gentlemen was organizing it and I saw it kind of mentioned on Facebook and I shoehorned myself into it. It's like, I want to go to that. And so I signed right. up and, and was able to visit some different layouts. And one of the uh, railroads I visited was Greg McComas's Michigan interstate and, uh, got to operate on his railroad. And, um, because he's also a freelancer, um, right we've been able to keep in contact and he'll let me know, kind of know some of the stuff going on. And, and then uh, with, with Greg, there was an opportunity where I, I said, Hey, I've, I've got this weekend open. If you know of anybody that's got an operating session open and he's like, well, let me, let me check with my friend Dean. And uh, he messaged me a couple hours later. He's like, yeah, Dean can, can give you a spot if you want to come to cater this weekend. And 
Uh, I'm very thankful for Dean Ferris. He's, uh, he's allowed me to operate in this railroad ever since. Uh, so when I'm able to, I'll go up there and, and run trains. They're a little small. They're in scale, but I can <laughs> yep. look past that. Uh, All right. And he's got a great concept. He, he's great with his scenery, great with his operations. He's been getting us involved with timetable operations lately. That's a whole new avenue. Um, that's a whole new challenge. Yeah. Excellent. So, yeah, you, you stick your head out. You start networking down there. You're meeting some great guys and Greg McComas and Dean Ferris. And mm-hmm. and uh, I think you mentioned Chris. I think you were referencing Chris Atkins, Atkins. correct? Yes, Chris yeah, Atkins. So, uh-huh. so, yeah, so you've got you've met some re- three really great guys down in that Dallas-Fort Worth area and you're starting to network in. When is it time for Joe to start building his layout down in Texas? Oh, well... I could wait to dig a basement, which that doesn't exist down here. I think you've heard that a few times. <laughs> so yeah, it's a little tough down there. It, it, it's hard. Yeah. Um, it's hard to find space in a house. I've got a, a young family. So, I mean, all the rooms are used and I've thought about the garage and this and that. Um, but back to that San Pedro Eastern and keep putting those passenger cars on that switching layout, knowing that that's not what that's designed for. I knew that I needed to build a railroad that would handle what my wants were and not, not necessarily to sacrifice everything. Just, just make sure that, that it can accommodate some of my wants. And so, um, you know, you get a couple of wild ideas, but, um, one of the ideas I had was to talk to, um, like a shed, manufacturer someone who who builds uh you know manufactured sheds and uh price the one out and you know they'll pretty much do whatever you want to do you just got to pay for it my budget didn't always allow that and so Mm -hmm. i sat down with them and i said okay well this is what i want to do this is what i want to put in it and uh they're like oh well that's kind of different and uh go through the process and you know they're like well how many windows you want no windows you know and they look yep. at you funny like why don't you want windows like well i'm just going to cover them up anyways i don't i don't need windows and they're like well how many doors do you want i said one and they're like well you got to put a double door on there I'm like well i guess i'll put a double door but i only really want one and they're like okay okay well, where do you want the door and i'm sitting there thinking okay well if i if i want to turn the tracks around here i need probably about eight nine feet or ten you know something like that and kind of come up with a quick dimensional concept for it and they're like okay well we can do that and they're like okay well how long will it take they're like oh we can deliver it in two weeks i'm like what i'm like okay that's cool yeah and and then they were they were very quick they were very fair on their price i mean um sheds are a viable solution that doesn't get talked about very often but if you got room on your land um, i got 1.25 acres so i've got room and uh, we hauled it in and put it in the back and it's worked out pretty well since then. Um, we even got to pick our colors. Uh, they said, what colors do you want? Nice. And I said, well, the Milwaukee painted their buildings gray. Let's paint it gray. And they're like, well, what do you want nice. to trim? I'm like, oh, I get to pick a trim too. I said, well, it seems like they used a dark gray. So let's go dark gray. And so this thing shows up and I'm looking at this thing going, man, that does. That looks like a right away building. It, it, to me, it feels like it could very easily have been along the Milwaukee somewhere and look at those double doors on the side. I was like, you know, I could see this thing holding a speeder or something in it. So I, I started calling it the speeder shed, you know, it was never an authentic building, okay. but looking at it, I was like, you know, it kind of, kind of feels right. So I think I ordered a little Milwaukee Herald and on, and some decals for my little letterboard sign. And I was like, well, what am I going to put up there on that letterboard? I was like, I can't call it an authentic name because it's not an authentic, you know, right away building, but you know, the railroad's the Chinook lines. Let's call it Chinook. So I uh nice. I painted me some piece of metal and and put the Chinook lettering on there and you know, I I, I look out there and it makes me smile. It makes me think of it, you know. Little piece of Milwaukee in the middle of Texas. Nice, nice. Not not all of us can have authentic bunkhouses like some uh, other Texas modeler 
can, you know? That, yeah, that, yeah that, that, that's, a, that's a rare one, and that's a great story. And if you're, if you're wondering what we're talking about, we're talking about Chris Adkins. Uh, go back and, you know, after you've list, done listening to this, go back and listen to the Chris Adkins interview about his and how he acquired it. It's, it's, it's definitely a great story. So, um, and I'm looking forward to uh, getting down there and seeing both of yours, but we'll talk about that in a bit. Um, so you got the shed, you got it in place. And then where's the track plan? Have you, is this like kind of like been sketched on a napkin and you've got like five revisions of it or did you have it in your head? Where was the track plan coming from? Oh, it was definitely in my head at first and heads don't download the paper very well. You can't just plug them into a printer and there they go. So the other problem, right. The other problem with, (laughs) with, with mines are in your mind, you can make anything fit. And that's right. not, that's not a reality. And so, you know, I, I started drawing things. I started facilitating some of the concepts out. I knew I wanted it point to point. Uh, I knew I wanted it double deck. Uh, I knew kind of the general area I wanted to put it. Um, I definitely wanted to have Cleellum uh, because that was that central pivot for me in discovering the Milwaukee and Washington and whatnot. Um so there was there was definitely a list of things that I wanted and 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 kind of some self discoveries in it, but anybody who's drawing layouts needs to understand. Just because you can make a curve doesn't mean that it will actually work that way. Um, so one of the best tools I actually bought were the the, the drawing diagrams. You know, you you can buy little templates that will. You know, if you follow the skill of the template, you can put a 22 inch radius down, a 24 inch radius down. And when you start playing with the proper radiuses of curves, you start discovering the stuff takes up a lot more space than you realized it did. And doing so, and and, and I do have a drawing uh, to follow that template scale. It's actually kind of big. I think it's uh, two pieces of eight and a half I've I've, uh, taped together for each different level. But, um, you know, drawing that out has helped. I've been able to follow it for the most part. Um, I've discovered some other problems with it. So there is a certain fluidity to it that, that has to be followed. You have to be willing to compromise in some ways. Maybe you can't quite put that switch exactly where you want it. Um, but yeah, definitely follow the scale. If, 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 if you don't have a template, uh, go get one. Go on eBay right now. Go go buy a template because if you're in the drawing phase, you will thank yourself later. Um, otherwise, you end up with 18 inch radiuses, and then you try to put <laughs> six axle locomotives on it. You don't know why they're derailing, you know. And 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 I think most people will catch themselves before that point. But yeah, yeah, and definitely won't be able to get those 86 foot box cars around the corner that you've, <laughs> you've worked on with with Chris. So. So let's, before I get too far ahead of myself, and we've got the shed, we've got a a track plan, and maybe I'm bouncing back to it, but you came up with not only the name, the logo, but then you also came up with a paint scheme. Talk about your locomotive roster and the the paint scheme that you've put on them. So kind of back to that phase of trying to figure out my decaling and and whatnot uh playing with different colors for locomotives um i like i think most people would go to the hobby store and you'd look at your paints and you'd look at santa fe red you'd look at amtrak silver for me it was dnh avon blue i love that blue but i i painted some things with it and it looked pretty pretty interesting but i always had one little problem with it it was dnh's color not my color (laughs) yep right and and I felt like if you're modeling a freelance, you should could enjoy certain ownership of even the colors. And so I forced myself to get out of the railroad aisle. And um, I s- happened upon some military paints for Model Master and was looking through those. And uh, Germans use some interesting colors for World War II. Um, and I kind of discovered an eggshell blue color. And I was like, man, that's different. I can't think of any railroads off the top of my head that were running a color quite like that. And so I looked at that and I said, that could be different. And so um, I brought that home, painted some stuff up. And I was like, man, these locomotives are going to get really grungy in that color. I said, I love it. 
Uh, people always challenge me like, man, your stuff's going to look really dirty in that. I was like, I know exactly. That's why I'm doing it. I, I want them to be dirty. I want them to be grungy. And then the other reason was uh, my competition in my mind was Burlington Northern. So how do you look different than Cascade Green and Black? You got to, you know, you know, go a different shade of color entirely, different, different tonal, you know, color entirely. And I felt like blue was a nice uh, difference than, than Burlington Northern's colors. And then I was also thinking about Washington state. Most of it's very uh, green with trees and whatnot. And I thought these blue locomotives might look kind of neat against green trees. And, um, but the only consideration I didn't take was blue skies, but I can live with that. Um, but, but I took this, uh, I think it was RLM 68 home and painted up some stuff of it. And it's like, that's really cool. But do I really want to tell people I'm painting something in a Luftwaffe color? Uh, let's start calling it Rainier blue. And so I kind of, you know, did exactly what the railroads did. We, we trademarked our own color. Now it, it has changed some over the years. Um, I've gotten away from using model master colors. Uh, I tried Sherwin Williams for a little bit. Their batch kind of turned out real minty. There's some of those colors still kind of floating around, but I'm not happy with it. But you know what? Like the rail railroads, we just have some different interesting paint colors in our, in our fleet for various reasons. And that's just a batch that kind of came out minty, but I, I use a, a, a teal color now and, um, real happy with it, but it's still in our books, Rainier blue, even though it looks a little bit different from the gray, gray blue that we've started with. And, um, if some people want to know if it's blue or green, yes, it's, <laughs> it's whatever, it's whatever you see it is. Um, I call it blue, right. but you know, it, it's, it's definitely meant to be in that, that weird spot. And it was to give it identity. It was to give it a, a different identity. And then how did you come up? You came up with, so you have the blue and then I'm seeing a picture that's actually behind you. And we'll share some photos of Joe's here oh, sure. on the Facebook post for the show. Uh, but that, it looks like it's got a yellow nose to it as well. So back to my comment about blue skies. <laughs> uh, I've actually delved into some interesting studies that railroads have made. The government has made on conspicuity. And, you know, it's actually pretty challenging to make a locomotive be seen at a grade crossing. It's not something I think a lot of people think about, but most railroads have to address that concern. And my blue locomotives have the same problem. If you're on a nice blue clear day in the middle of summer and, you know, there's no trees around, how are you going to see a blue locomotive coming at you? And right. so, um, you know, I, I think the natural progression is to go to a nice bright color, yellow, red, orange, something like that. But for me, I think the yellow kind of existed from the Milwaukee also. I came kind of going back to their freight cars, and it just felt like it was a, an appropriate match to it. Um, mm -hmm. And then I, I adopted something else kind of unique by accident, I guess. But um, the front step wells are also painted yellow on the back of my locomotives they are not they are also painted blue and it's another one of those subliminal influences uh i've been challenged on like why don't you paint the back yellow too i was like eh, i don't know i just i like the way it is and, and i have painted the back panels yellow but I, I leave the walkways blue still and i realized what influenced that years later uh the mrnt the milwaukee rant scene and okay. and troy they paint the front of their locomotives white with their white step wells and the back of them are blue. And it, I guess it's one of those things that even though you look at these magazines when you're a kid, it comes to the surface again later. And you may not make a decision on purpose, but uh, it, it was uh, another uh, another fun influence for me to, to kind of invoke that a little bit. Another influence kind of came to the surface from that. Um, but yeah, there's, there's yellow up there. Uh, that nose stripe... Uh, probably comes from that test locomotive I did in Avon Blue. Uh, I took VA, uh, I'm sorry, Via Rail passenger stripes and put it on the nose of a of a yellow nose, and I was like, "That's cool." And what's neat about it for me though is I don't have to worry about like chevron angles or getting this or that. It's just just slap it <laughs> right across the front of it. <laughs> right. But once yeah. again, it was something different, and and um, part of that conspicuity report that the government has is it's not just bright color 
it's it's bright color with dark colors and cool colors and warm colors there there's a whole sequence to it that actually drives your eye to recognize something moving and right. uh you know even though i've never had to test my concepts in the real world i feel like the rubber does accomplish it in, in a scale form so you're 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 looking to be FRA compliant, even though you don't have to be, just to <laughs> just to bring the accuracy, right? That's, <laughs> right. That's fantastic. You got, you've got you 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 you've you've taken it to that level, which is really cool. And you know, it's it's just a really neat concept. The whole freelance thing, and it just really amazes me. Tell me about your locomotive fleet. We talked about the scheme. What do you got for power there? Uh, there's a lot of things I like. And that can be its own Achilles heel to freelance. Um, you know, we like it, we buy it a lot of times. And so um, I've ended up with like SDP 45s and FP 45s and, you know, your SD 40 2s and your Jeeps and whatnot. Um, but when you're trying to create authentic reasons for having things you don't always get that luxury and so some of the stuff i've been able to excuse in my mind and other things i've just had to say no i can't do it i'm sorry as much as i want to um <laughs> but that also comes from my choice and era and um i was originally abiding by eric Bruman's concept of model modeling your modern railroad and I backdated it by five years just to give an opportunity to catch up with manufacturing and whatnot. And I was all going forward with this. And um, I think I had painted up a Jeevo and some things like that. And I started seeing where the real railroads are going. And I'm like, you know, I don't really enjoy it as much as I used to enjoy rail fanning and, and where the railroads were from when I was younger. And so, um, I actually backdated it to 1998 and my reason for backdating it to 1998 also was to excuse my like interest in Alco locomotives and first generation GEs. Um, mm -hmm. While the class ones really weren't known for having that kind of equipment, I felt like a fledging short line regional possibly could. And I'm sure that there are plenty of examples to show that, that, that is true. Um, so yeah, it gave me an opportunity to, to start rostering some Alcos and and my first generation GEs and and keeping my EMDs in there. And um, I will say the roster is diverse, and there are some examples that would definitely make people be like, "What? Why?" That's okay. It's it's part of the fun of having your own railroad. But I'll, I'll give you kind of the, the the key component there is I do have a U thirty CG on my roster. A U30 okay. CG is a passenger locomotive that the Santa Fe bought. Uh, I believe there were only five examples of it built by General Electric. That is the fully cowled GE. And okay. uh, I knew I wanted one or, you know, at least to have in the collection or whatever. And I, you know, I always wondered what it would look like in a different paint scheme. And I happened upon a, a brass locomotive from a friend of mine. And I was like, okay, well, I'm going to get this, but how do I make this fit the railroad now? And I discovered that, oh, GE actually had these things on their property up till early 80s. I was like, well, my railroad started in 1980. So, you know, Berlin's Northern was buying these FP45s. And, you know, what if we wanted cow locomotives? What if, you know, what, how would a railroad that doesn't have a name to themselves be able to go buy something and be like, oh, you know, you buy our junk in the back, you know, the back lot. You know, and and so the, the joke is that, you know, we came to GE, like, we want a cow locomotive. Like, yeah, okay, good luck with that. Like, hey, we got this junk in the back. You want it? Yeah, okay. And so, you know, uh, the nice. idea is that we bought what we could, which, uh, you know, we we probably started with all five. And, and I could see in reality probably needing parts and stuff. So now that I'm only 98, there's only going to be one active on the roster. That's cool, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but it goes back to trying to make it, realistic and i'm i'm hoping people listen it's going like well that's just too far fetched it, hey you know what it, it, ask me I'll, I'll 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 bore you to details <laughs> how we thought we could come up with this. I, I think, i've actually bought uh go ahead i was gonna say i think 
you know, all you got to do is find one example out of it out in the real world and it's justified, right? Just one. It's got to find oh, yeah. one railroad Absolutely. that did it and then you're and then you're golden. I've actually bought area, uh, issues of extra 2200 West, I believe is what the title was. Uh, I bought them all from throughout the 80s and into the 90s. And one thing that's really neat about that magazine was they actually showcased a lot of the acquisitions and retirements and this and that. And it, to me, it's fascinating. You can find the oddest stuff being sold and you're looking at this goal. Well, that was May of 85. Like I, that's plausible. Like we really could end up with that. Like that's, uh, you know, that's something that really could be here, you know, and, and that to me is really fun. Um, it, it's getting into the details that make it possible. So there's, there's some interesting stuff on the roster. That's awesome. It must take a lot of discipline too, you know, with being a freelance and in, in setting that date of 1998 so that it keeps your, your uh, wallet in your back pocket when all these other new locomotives come out and, you know, it's, it's gotta be tempting, but a, you know, a high level of discipline not to pick them up and, and put, put your paint on them. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it, it's a blessing <laughs> in disguise sometimes too. Yeah. It, it's, it's, um, yeah. You know, you can, you can, you can look at announcements and be like, ah, okay, well, I can't get away with that. And, and you move on, mm-hmm. you know, but, but unfortunately there's still a lot of stuff you can do. <laughs> and right. that's the fun thing yeah. with freelance is, is you can look at a product and be like, okay, Aurora is coming out with SD 60 Fs. And you're like, could I, which I ended up not going that route, but I did consider it, you know, <laughs> It's, it's hard to, you know, I, I, like I said, personally, I could just see how much fun I could have with a freelance railroad, you know, coming up with that scheme, coming up with a logo and it would just tickle so many things for me with the, with the graphic design kind of, you know, thing I enjoy. So it, it's, I, I'm always fascinated to talk to freelance model railroaders and, and even more fascinated. I want to get to this before we run out of time, your connection with Chris Palmieri and home shops and, uh, He's he's uh, creating a, a car with your logo on it as well. Why don't you tell us about that and how that that project developed? Ah, good old Chris. Um, so I actually did a run of uh, ACF covered hoppers from Acurel, and um, that was quite an endeavor. I think a lot of my fellow freelancers have always had that desire to get a production of cars done. And, um, no, fortunately, Acrail doesn't require a whole lot, uh, but for a lot of people, it's, it's pretty expensive. And so it was an undertaking to get me to that point. And, and even to this day, I still want to do future runs and it's like, okay, well, can I really swallow that pill right now? But I, I finally ponied up and I did a run of 48 and, um, I got these cars coming in and it's like, okay, well, most of these are destined for my railroad. But uh, I allocated probably a little more than half of them for other modelers if they wanted them. And, um, you know, uh, Chris actually uh, messaged me regarding the Chinook cars. And uh, I was like, yeah, mm-hmm. you know, I'll, I'll make some available for you. I think I'd actually already kind of decided to keep what I had, so to speak. But he he messaged me wanting some. And I was like, yeah, you know what? I for you, Chris. Yeah, absolutely. Let's, let's do this. And so, uh, I gave him, I think like half a dozen or so. And, and, um, you know, he, he, uh, he, he kind of comes at me a little bit later. He's like, Hey, I've got this idea of doing the same thing basically, but doing it on higher quality cars. I'm like, Oh, that'd be great. Absolutely. I'm all mm-hmm. for that. And, uh, you know, he, he, he kind of threw around some of the ideas and, uh, he came back and told me, well, we're going to do 4750s. I'm like, oh, heck yeah. I need a, I need a whole lot of these things. Um, yep. I mean, that was the backbone of Milwaukee's covered, harf, cover, covered car fleet. So, you know, I was like, man, I, I could definitely use a lot of these things. He goes, well, I've got them all booked up. I was like, oh, <laughs> man. And then he came back and goes, well, what do you think about an 80, 86 foot box car? And I'm like, nah, I don't need that. I don't have <laughs> auto parts in my neck of the woods. That's uh, this is just not what I need. I said, you come back to me when you got something I can use. He goes, oh, okay, you know. A little while later, he comes back and goes, hey, what about those eighty-six foot box cars? I'm making art. He's like, man, <laughs> I've already turned you down once. Like, no, I, I don't see how I could use these things, you know. And then uh, 
I had actually bought a, a book on the short lines in the Pacific Northwest, and I'm flipping through this thing, and I see these Burlington Northern 86 foot box cars on the back end of a of a I think a Camas and Prairie. Sorry, Chris, I don't know if I said it right. A Camas and Prairie rail net train, and I'm like, hmm, why are these here? Why are these Burlington Northern 86 foot box cars on this railroad? And I'm like, you know what? I remember Washington Central having some 86 foot box cars. I'm like, you know what? Maybe there's something to these cars that I hadn't considered. And so when Chris came back to me the third time, he goes, what do you think about these 86 foot box cars? I'm like, absolutely. Let's do them. He's like, really? I'm like, yeah, <laughs> I've, I've discovered some things since we last talked. And he's like, well, what would you discover? And I said, okay, well, these are going on to Lewiston. I have no idea why Washington central had these. I can't really quite figure out exactly why, but you know what? I know that they were here. Let's do it. He said, okay, well, what are you thinking? And uh, I said, well, I know they're going to need to be federal yellow. My, my freight cars uh, use Milwaukee's golden fleet colors, which is federal yellow. Okay. And uh, being that we merged with BC Hydro, and, and and I've always liked this idea of being Canadian compliant. Um, you know, you joked about FRA compliant. Canada has some very yep. strict, unusual rules as well. And uh, I, I enjoy making my stuff where my locomotives could actually be lead locomotives in Canada. So, um, but anyways, yeah, uh, we follow the data block that, that Canadian railroads use. And, um, but yeah, I said, okay, well, this is kind of what we're thinking, you know, what I'm thinking, but I said, you know, I want to learn more about Washington central. They had these, this weird superior logo on it. They had these maxi, you know, logo on it. I'm like, I don't know what this was about, but I feel like that's what should be on this car. And he goes, I think that'd be really cool. I think that that would really be neat. I'm like, okay, well, let's, let's start figuring this out. And so I did more research and he did drawings and, and whatnot. And, um, I hadn't actually done a, a box car for Chinook yet. Um, so, you know, he's giving me these drawings. I'm like, man, that's too much yellow. <laughs> I'm like, I love TTX cars with that black door. I always had, I mean, I, I, I grew up with, with rail box cars. I mean, I remember seeing them everywhere and I, that's another one of those earmarks of, of childhood for me. I was like, I know it's going to look like rail box. I don't care. I want black doors. I said, okay. Yeah. He goes, well, where do you want your paw print logo? It's like, I don't know. We, we kind of have it busy here on this side. We kind of have it busy on that side. I said, I don't know. I wanted to get away from that TTX car, that braille box car. What if we put that logo right on the doors? And he's like, man, that's going to be a pain to decal. I said, yeah, but we're having the manufacturer do it, right? He goes, yeah. I said, let's <laughs> challenge them. Let's see if they can do it. He said, okay. So, so we, we put nice. a big paw print on that door. And, and I, I think it came out really very cool, but, um, I've done more research on those cars and I found out that Washington central assigned them to, uh, John Manville. Uh, John Manville is a building insulation manufacturer. Um, they build fiberglass or make manuf uh, fiberglass insulation. And, uh, they come out of Northern California. They did come out of Northern California going up the Pacific Northwest, but, uh, through his research, he knows like the Burlington Northern cars out in Lewiston were getting loaded with like milk cartons and, and other cardboard products. So there's a lot of fiber industry that 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 produces a high cellulose product that's perfect for these box cars. They're they're bulky, lightweight commodities. And another thing that's interesting about these cars is they don't have to be in an auto parts train. They can be on any manifest. They can go to any part of the country. They're not restricted in their use outside of their, their profile restrictions. But I mean, uh, I even read about one car that was loaded with hay going back to Kentucky for the Derby. So if you, <laughs> if you can think of something that's lightweight that can go in these cars, now I don't know if that's true, but if, I mean, if you can think of anything lightweight to go in these cars, do it. And if you want to yeah. run them in your auto parts train, do it. They got to get back somehow. Do it. So there you go. You know, Home Shops is selling these cars. I encourage you to pull up their website, go to Home Shops, support Chris, support what he's doing. It's not just my stuff out there. He has a tremendous amount of product for freelance railroads out there. 
Chris is a great supporter of the Around the Layout podcast and absolutely everybody. Homeshops.net, go and check that out. We'll uh, provide a link also in the Facebook uh, post, and we'll also put some pictures up of the uh, 86-foot uh, box car with Chinook lines on it. It's a beautiful-looking car and uh, definitely look good on your railroad. Uh, before we uh, completely wrap up here, I want to just mention uh, you've got a big event going on in your neighborhood this August. Uh, talk about the Texas Express and what you've got going on for that. So the NMRA convention, it will be in the DFW area. Um, and uh, one of the oh, the fun parts of it are to go to layout tours and see different layouts. Um, we, uh, with my railroad, have been able to get on the operations side of things. So we are hosting three operation sessions during the week. Uh, we are on Monday night, Wednesday night, and Friday night. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll be we'll be hosting some operations on uh, the Chinook, little taste of Washington and Texas. Um, we nice. look forward to it. It's gonna be a lot of work, but we look forward to it. Yeah, for sure. I'm looking forward to getting down there and uh, seeing your layout along with the whole list of Texans that we mentioned earlier in the show. Really looking forward to being in the Lone Star State again and uh, checking out the uh, national convention and your layout as well. I can't wait to get over there and see it. No, we look forward to having you, Ray. Joe, thank you for being on Around the Layout and sharing your story and uh, look forward to seeing you down in Texas in August. Yeah, thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Around the Layout. Learn more about today's show on our Facebook page, facebook.com backslash around the layout. Show your support by becoming an operating crew member at patreon.com backslash around the layout podcast. Past episodes and more can be found on our website, around the layout.com. And send us your feedback around the layout at gmail.com. Thanks for hanging out with us around the layout.